Young, who says, um, cancer evaluation of Decepticon capability indicates distinct tactical deficiency. <laughs> I remember someone asking, um, when it's going to some comment, they said, oh, I'm embarrassed to ask you this, but can you still do Perceptor? It was like, Perceptor wasn't that difficult. And it's like, you know, that's where my voice is. Um, although lately, the last few years, I've been doing mostly things down on the bottom. Uh, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Colonel Campbell, um, Grandpa Max and Ben 10. Um, oh gosh, what else? Just a bunch of stuff. Um, one of my favorites that somebody mentioned earlier, who I was really happy about because he was also on it, um, was uh, the Toxic, Toxic Crusaders. Crusaders. Woo! <laughs> yes! That was before you guys were born. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Some of you were pushing clouds very hard. Raise your hand if you're old. What's old? <laughs> <laughs> you're my people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the tribe is here. The, toxic, the, later. the thing I learned about the Toxic Crusaders, at least twice in every show, that, that was the directive uh, from Trauma, at least twice in every show, someone had to say, um, my character was Nozone, who had a huge nose, and his power was sneezing. And he would say, uh, uh, we're hideously deformed creatures of superhuman size and strength. So he had to do that at least twice. Do you remember? Yes. Yeah. That was the director from Troma, because we were the, uh, we were toxic. Anyway, so that's basically uh, me. Right. Well, I'm David Sobolov. Well, there's no directive, but I kind of made this up with Shockwave. Um, he always says logical, of course, but there's always a pause before he says logical. So your mission tonight, if anyone chooses to accept this, is go on YouTube, find a couple of clips of him, and let me know the average. I'm kind of like, there's a thing. There's a certain, and they edit this, so I don't know what they do. I think before, when I say something and then say logical, there's a certain number of seconds. But they've decided that it has to be, the pause has to be just the right pause. So I'm very curious to know how long that is. I think it's about four seconds, but anyway. And, you know, I played Beast Wars a long time ago. Did I say Death Charge? It's not about Shockwave. No, I said Death Charge. I'm still getting over my jet lag. Here. Now, these days, I'm playing Drax um, from Guardians of the Galaxy. Not live action. You know, they're promoting the, the movie in the Fall of 14. So Marvel is, it's interesting, it's like now what they do, this new thing, they'll give you a series, but it's not really a series. What they do is they stick you in every show. So they've got Drax and all the Guardians of the Galaxy on um, Spider-Man and Avengers and Hulk and video games and whatever else. So you never know where, where he'll pop up in a little while. As long as they still put the character in. As long as they put the character in, he has one line on that. Yes. <laughs> it only takes one line to cash the check. <laughs> so when I go to the bank next time, somebody gives me a check, I just say one line, and they'll give me the, my money. Okay. You go to the bank, they say, how was your day today? You go, I'm Drax. Oh, you go, Just pass them a note, I'm Drax. Just take it all! <laughs> I, I play Lobo too for GC. <laughs> Yeah, whenever that pops up, yeah. we'll see if you keep using it. Yes. Well, that's me. Hello, I'm Hal Rail. Woo! Um, I was Miss Piggy. <laughs> and Guns All the Great! As well as Anna Mom! Uh, in Transformers, I was uh, Snarl Dinobot! <laughs> Shut up now, the Insecticon to come. <laughs> and uh, Pipes and Schizoid and uh, also uh, Primacron. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I have gotten to play a lot of different kinds of cartoons. I left Hollywood 20 years ago and moved to uh, Denver to raise my daughter. Uh, and she's doing well, thank you very much for asking. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, before she I moved to Los Angeles, uh, yeah. <laughs> she's moving to Los Angeles as soon as she graduates. You know, <laughs> circle goes round and round. Uh, if you are any uh, sci-fi fans, I uh, played the Predator in Predator Two, <laughs> and uh, IMDb for the rest, I guess. 
the GI Joe, I was uh, deep six on the water demolitions. I defused 50 megaton bombs. Colonel, I like to work alone. I was also Admiral Ledger, the head of the Pacific Northwest Fleet. As well as Shikali, the Prince of the Desert Sands. <laughs> and uh, the, for these things, that, that interestingly enough, that I, I was also fortunate enough to be able to play Apu, Mo, and Wiggum for The Simpsons when Hank Azari was off doing Birdcage. So there wasn't that much difference between these. Oh my goodness, you have got to stop it down this ripping cup and back away. Don't make me use on local ports. <laughs> so it's amazing when one blends into the next. But, uh, that's me. Very nice to be here. Oh, that. Uh, Top it. <laughs> my, my name is John Bailey. I am a fan to become a professional. Uh, I do a lot of movie trailers. You'll hear me on TV saying, In a world that's Friday on PG-13. Uh, and I'm also uh, the voice of the council and the elder and next comment of the unknown. Hello, Commander. In response to the alien threat, we've decided to activate the XCOM project. <laughs> and uh, I borrowed Steve Bloom's, Behold the greatest threat to the ethereal ones. Uh, I'm also in five upcoming games that are not out yet that I'm not allowed to talk about. And my, uh, my, only, my only professional Transformers uh, job was the voice of Anakin in the Darth Vader Anakin Quad Changer toy. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had to come up with a few lines because they didn't have anything for Anakin to say other than just, you know, whining. Uh, and my, uh, my Transformers fandom claim to fame is, you know, doing uh, parodies and spoofs online and thanks to these other gentlemen uh, that helped out every once in a while. and So yeah, I get asked to say, Autobots transform and roll out. <laughs> and I'm also a member of the Sabertron.com podcast podcast, which is the other guys are right back there in the row back there, so. <laughs> and then there was me. <laughs> well, Anakin. I have the high ground. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm, I'm Daniel Ross. Uh, I am an actor, voice actor. Uh, my Transformers claim to fame was uh, back in 2007. And Starscream. <laughs> that was uh, a lot of fun to do. And uh, now I'm a film producer working on uh, the Ninjas vs. series, Ninjas vs. Monsters, coming out very soon. Uh, Z-Con, which I'm representing today, this is a film for charity. Uh, the last film from director Mike Doherty raised about... It was $120,000 for three different, excuse me, three different charities. Uh, his last film was uh, Brown Coats Redemption, a Firefly uh, fan film. So this next one we're looking to raise about a quarter million dollars uh, for some different charities, and it's about a zombie infestation at a convention. <laughs> <laughs> very, very happen. topical. Um, so check it out, guys. It's youhavebeeninfected.com, and uh, let's get this Q&A started. How about we? True, it only takes one bite to get the whole zombie thing going at a convention. It takes one bite, but how many licks does it take? Well, <laughs> we digress. <laughs> does anyone have any Q's or A's for us? You can give us answers. We can Jeopardy. They can give us answers and we can give them all the questions on Mars. They're still waiting for Peter Cullen to show up. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? 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 I don't know. Um, why don't we start, look like each of you in the voice acting. How'd you get your start? Oh, I don't know if we have enough time for all of us. <laughs> uh, I started out doing, um, I was a stage actor first. Uh, that was my first love. Um, worked in Minnesota, Minneapolis, which is a great theater town for a long time, for 10 years. Uh, and did a lot of um, uh, stage work, improv, and uh, did, uh, did some, a lot of commercials, on-camera commercials, and then started doing voiceover commercials, and um, moved to L.A. and signed with an agent. Uh, I didn't know anybody. I decided that I was time to be a nobody again after being a, a big fish in a small pond in Minnesota. Moved out to L.A., didn't know anyone there, signed with an agent who signed me for commercials only because they, needed, they didn't need anybody voiceover. They had all, everybody they needed. And I said, no, so you keep me working, I'm happy. And I was there for a short time. I did a play where I, uh, called Cloud Nine. Uh, it was a West Coast premiere of this great show where I played an African man servant, uh, a Cockney soldier, and a five-year-old girl. 
<laughs> the uh, beard was the convincing aspect. No, no beard. I, I, I looked. I really. I was the ugliest little girl ever. Uh, they had me in the old frilly little panties and Mary Jane shoes and a wig. The, the whole idea of the show was you knew that it was a man playing a child. You knew it was a white man playing a black man. Um, it just it was about the roles people accept and take on. And there was a lot of cross dressing and stuff. Um, it's true. Uh, we had men playing women, women playing men. These are the prerequisites to getting into voiceover. Yeah, you have to do this first. See how, see how good you look in dresses and see how good you look in men's clothing, women. Uh, but uh, casting director at Hanna-Barbera, by the name of Gordon Hunt, Helen Hunt's father, uh, came and saw the show. Who's still directing, by the way. Still directing and still teaching class, too. Um, and uh, he, um, uh, he saw the show liked what he saw, called, found out who my agent was, asked me to come in for a general at Hanna-Barbera. I went in and read like eight or ten different kinds of characters, you know, from wizards to, uh, you know, younger, younger characters to, you know, trolls and whatever. And he brought me in for some um, auditions and I started booking. And before you knew it, I was doing the Transformers and the GoBots. I got to do the Smurfs and the Jetsons, work the Yogi Bear and, um, these are all, you know, guest star things, you know. Uh, and it was really cool because I got to work with people that I grew up listening to. When I was working with Dawes Butler, who was still doing Elroy, the eight-year-old kid, and he was in his 70s. And I said, yeah, this is cool, you know. The great thing about voiceover is it doesn't matter what you look like, how old you are, how tall, how short, how fat or skinny. It's all in your voice, in your talent. If you got the talent, then you can do it until you croak, you know. Uh, so that's how it started. It will stop you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have a tendency, you know, your, your workload, you know, really diminishes when you die. Um, but that's, that's basically how it happened with me. And I mean, because I, I didn't move out to LA to, to be a voice actor, I moved out to LA to do film and TV. And it all worked out. Very similar deal with me. I was in a, a small pond. Vancouver is fairly small, I guess, compared to LA. A beautiful yeah. small pond. Yeah, it's very beautiful. And I was, first I was a French horn player professionally. I did Peter Orchestra work. Then I was touring around with an acapella group. And at some point I was doing stage work and an uh, agent saw me and said, you know, you've got a great voice for, you got a great face for radio, you should do this. <laughs> so yeah, I started doing films. But it's, I have a really interesting story with the very first series I did. Does anybody remember Vortec? Yes. Very, very obscure series from 1995, 96 on Fox. Um, I was with my acapella group, and Sue Blue cast me in that thing. And I, I had to pay to do this. is a series that I didn't make a cent on. In fact, I probably paid twice as much as I was paid to do this series because I was performing in rural British Columbia, way up and way up remote, so remote. I had to hire a private plane to come and get me in a small little airstrip in the middle of the forest. And the whole week of shows we had booked, I had to pay everybody's salary for the whole week to be able to go, because I got cast like with no notice. So I mean, it cost me like several thousand dollars, but I had to do it. It was my first big gig. And, and so Sue, Blue, Sue Blue is, is directing me right now in uh, Ben 10. Oh, That's funny, because I don't see Sue Blue in the room. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Yeah. Right now. Oh, I got that. Yeah, she directs <laughs> the Beast Wars. That's cool. And Vortex. She's great. She is great. And Sue Blue directed us in Toxic in Crusaders. In Toxic Crusaders. <laughs> Sue, Sue Blue is, was also RC in Gen 1 uh, Transformers. She's been around forever and she's amazing. She's, uh, you know, if you ever get a chance to meet her, um, go for it. She's yeah, Death Charge was what he was, you know, because of her. You know, she was, when she directs, she's right there in the scene with you. She's not just she's not pressing press the button and saying no. She's she's active. Yeah, because she's also she's also an actress. She's still on my commercial reel. We did a, a commercial together twenty four years ago, and it's still on there because it was so cool. She's just wonderful. Sorry. Um, anybody remember a show called Galaxy High School? Yes. Okay. Well, you are old. You remember everything. I do. I was Doyle in uh, Galaxy High School. And Susan Blue was was Amy, my girl, the, the other girl from Earth who went to school up in space. So, uh, 
that's my degrees of separation with Sue Blue, plus <laughs> having her direct me in taxi crusaders and other things. Uh, I got into the business, um, I was a class clown growing up. Um, now they call it ADD. <laughs> I didn't know what the acronym was during those days. I just knew there was something different. Uh, I was never allowed to do a play or anything. Uh, come from a town of 1200 in Indiana, and I always had to have a job. And then I had cancer at 26, and I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And four years later, I was on top of the game in Hollywood. So. Uh, I was very, very fortunate. Um, as far as all this goes, I always had an, an, uh, a knack for doing animals and uh, creating sounds, and I came into it as an impressionist and did stand-up comedy around the country for a couple of years, and then I realized that that wasn't going to get me into cartoons. So uh, I, got, today. I, I got a, uh, I got a, a letter from uh, Jenny McSwain, who was then the head of casting at Hanna-Barbera, and she said, you're very talented, but why would I wait for you to fly into town to do something? You have to be here. So I moved there. And th that was my introduction into doing the voiceover business. Um, I, oh. I'm having a press conference. Um, I, uh, I fell into it accidentally. Uh, my original inspiration was hearing uh, Peter Cullen doing the uh, the intro for Voltron uh, back before TV completely sucked your brains out. Uh, I just kind of wasn't paying attention. All of a sudden, I heard Voltron, Defender of the Universe. I was like, "Whoa, what? that was cool!" And, I was, and then I heard him again in, in Transformers, and I immediately became a fan. And I was like, I'd, I'd, "I'd love to do that when I grow up." And it was just always something in the back of my head. And uh, MySpace came along, which I thought was a completely waste of, a waste of time. I was really off in the whole social networking thing. And my wife made me a, she forced me to get on MySpace. And, uh, and an ad popped up, because I'd always been, been interested in voice actors, and uh, it based ads on their interests. And a studio popped up in my hometown, which is Memphis, Tennessee, and I didn't know they had anything like that anywhere. And she's like, oh, you should go try out. I was like, I asked her, nah. And she said, well, the worst they can do is say no. I was like, huh. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. Uh, I went down there and auditioned, and it was a, it's a non-union uh, production company, but they have a chain across the country. And they signed me a month later. I got my first job two weeks after that. I don't know, this is the East Coast. Anybody ever heard of Texas Steakhouse right here? Uh, yeah, so. I'm the voice of Texas Steakhouse, a super chicken club. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, two months later, I was working for Hasbro doing, doing the voice of D. Bradley Baker's Captain Rex for all the commercials and toys. And uh, then I did some toy work, and then uh, later on, uh, I started messing around with YouTube. And my manager at the time uh, heard me doing the, what I called the Movie Men Tribute, which I did a whole bunch of different, uh, my favorite movie trailer guys. Peter Cullen used to do movie trailers. And of course, Don LaFontaine and, uh, uh, you know, Bo Weaver and all these great guys. And he's like, I'm really impressed that you not only you do these great trailer voices, but you also know who these guys are. Nobody knows who Ashton Smith is. And he said, would you mind reading some trailer copy? I was like, this is probably a 10-year-old kid, you know. Sure, why not? And the next thing you know, I'm doing movie, real movie trailers. And he said, would you like, well, I'd like to manage you. I was like, sure, okay. And the next thing you know, I'm with David's agency, and I've got co-management, which is one of the biggest movie trailer uh, managers in the company. She represents Tom King. No way, Miss Joey. But he also does a lot of uh, Pixar family movie trailers as well, so... Uh, and from there, I went to ADR. I did a lot of voice matching and movie trailers and TV shows. I replaced some dialogue for for um, the Chris main Walt. villain. <laughs> I've not done that professionally, uh, but for Chris, for Christopher Waltz in the movie Epic, I'm the guy who screams at the end and does his little uh, always wanted to destroy line. And, and y'all sir, we did an R.I.P. Never seen that before. I'm not sure what that was you do with so, and, uh, and that's a really fun, easy job to do, and they're like, hey, can you do this guy? Sure, why not? Hey, John, <laughs> have you ever met Peter Cole? Yes, several times. Uh, I'm the biggest honor of my life. Did you do the voice? I wasn't going to, but he asked me to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at first, I just said, you know, I, I wanted to thank you in person because you were the inspiration that, that led to my career. And I've got, I put food on the table and roof over my kid's head because you, he got all teary eyed. He's like, I'm honored. And I said, you know, I, I cut my teeth in this business doing Optimus Prime as a kid. And he said, how does that sound? And I said, oh, it sounds like Autobots transform. And he goes, oh, give me a hug, come here. <laughs> I first heard of you in a Transformer session. And Steve Blumen goes, is that a strong guy? 
is a really good Peter Cullen. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I only met him for about two seconds. His line got cut off at Vodka in one year. And I was like, I gotta at least say something. I said, Starscream, stand down. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> and A year later, he goes, I know you. You're that guy that did that Optimus Prime thing at Botcon last year. Like, remember that? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, uh, for me, wow. Um, I started a long time ago acting in school plays and uh, doing theater. I was a very good thespian. Um, and, uh, you know, I started coming home and impersonating my teachers and friends for, you know, family, and uh, it just kind of became a thing where I would just walk in one day, you know, plop my book back down, and I'd be talking like my teachers, and I was always weird. My parents were cracking up, and it just dawned on me later in life that, you know, maybe I could make money doing this. That would be kind of cool. Um, so, you know, I got into uh, uh, major, you know, theatrical productions, uh, you know, doing a lot of stage, doing a lot of musical theater, and uh, after a while, I slowly progressed into doing film work, independent films, uh, low-class B-rated horror films, and other such things, and uh, moving into production side of those things, and uh, slowly just kind of meandering into voiceover work. And um, I think uh, since I've always been such a huge Transformers fan, uh, doing the fan dubs uh, back in the day for like Beast Wars Neo, Beast Wars the Second, doing voices like I speak it was always so much fun for me, and it was a it was a way for me to kind of expand my knowledge base, and then coming to these things and meeting these guys and. You know, uh, having all these great inspirational figures uh, talking to me and encouraging me, I think that was probably the biggest thing that got me involved in voiceover. And then, of course, uh, you know, my biggest one was Transformers the Game in 2007, which was huge for me as a Transformers fan to get involved with. And since then, it's, you know, been commercials and uh, a couple video games. I'm working on uh, Dungeons and Dragons Neverwinter right now, which is really, really cool. And uh, some other things I can't talk about, so. <laughs> That's always fun to say. So telling the story about how you got a video game job is cool. <laughs> it was fun! <laughs> Wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> he stopped his way into that job. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. More questions! You know, I'll just, I'll just interject something here about NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. I have a, I, I collect old advertising and uh, old product packages and stuff, and I have a 1959 you know, squirt, the soda, squirt menu board that you a chalkboard, and it's completely full of all the stuff I can't talk about. <laughs> and when I can talk about it, I scratch it off. <laughs> and they're serious about that stuff. No, they are. Yeah, they are. It's I, so I, competitive I, nowadays. You gotta keep your mouth shut. When I did Diablo three. The contract actually said that I would. We oh, worked together. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> I, I believe the figure was three million dollars. I would have to pay them if I tweeted about it. <laughs> yeah, they're they're serious. Worth um, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I say bust the lip. Come on. Yeah, I have a similar situation because uh, with the, with ADR voice magic for trailers. You find out about movies two, three years in advance, and you're like, oh! <laughs> 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 going on Facebook. And the last convention I did, people were asking me what I had coming up next. I want to talk about this Guardians of the Galaxy thing. Well, the first Drax that I didn't finally aired two weeks ago. So now I can talk about yeah. it. Yeah. But I had recorded all this stuff I couldn't talk about. Now I can't. Yeah, that happened with, uh, with Metal Gear. was really, they were really, uh, Kanani is really serious about keeping your mouth closed about what's happening with Metal Gear. The Fallout 3, the same thing, all of them. Um, I remember when I, my first Pixar, I get to work on all the Pixar films, and the first one I worked on was Bugs Life. And um, if you remember, uh, Bugs Life was in production. It, right when DreamWorks, uh, when, uh, what's his name, left, uh, Katzenberg yeah. left Disney, is the name, went, went to DreamWorks. And that idea about Woody Allen. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, he knew, or they knew, that Bugs Life was coming out, so they rushed and got ants out ahead of time. So, uh, having they, they thought they were really going to ruin uh, a Bugs Life. Unfortunately, but fortunately, Bugs Life really was a terrific film and uh, and did great. Uh, but it was from then well, before that, but especially with that one, they said everybody's got to keep. Keep real quiet about what's going on, what's happening, and they didn't want anyone to know anything. But you know, they were working on termites, which was the sequel <laughs> to Ants, and they had to just scrub it. Oh, because Bugs Life killed it. Yeah. Who, 
Wait. <laughs> <laughs> hey, seriously, folks. This ain't hard. <laughs> Another question? Okay, we'll ask you questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's your favorite color, totally, guys? Blue looking black. What are you all doing here? Thanks for coming out. What's your name? My name's Michael. Hi, Michael. Hey, Michael. Um, is there any character in one of the Transformers shows that you really like and wish you got a chance at doing? And who would it be and what might they sound like if there was one? Very good. Excellent question. That's a very good question. Any that they would hire me for. <laughs> What's he sound like? Yeah, basically. <laughs> you want to know the absolute truth? Yeah, whatever they pay me for. Um, oh, gosh. You know what I would like to, to, to do? I would like them to bring back, um, in, you know, in, the, in the, the comic book, they made Perceptor um, into a, a sniper. Yeah. You, you know, okay? With you know all this, the whole thing, was, <laughs> and uh, someone said that uh, what would what would perceptor sound like now? Because the cast evaluation and tep capability doesn't really fit that that badass kind of guy. <laughs> no. So I, I I would like to do perceptor get it if they're gonna if they would ever bring him back that way, and he'd still be English, but um, cast evaluation and tep capability indicates it's distinct. Tactical deficiency. <laughs> so you're a little more, a little darker. You know? So I would love to do. I would love for that to happen. You know? um, because Perceptor never was the cool one. You know, <laughs> he wasn't small or or he grimla. You know, none of that stuff. You know, it's like he, you know, he was kind of you know a feat and you know absent-minded professor stuff. But I'd love to come back and uh, bring you back and do that kind of character. Well, I got to play Depth Charge and Shockwave, and I don't know, I'm pretty satisfied with those two guys. I'm really happy with them. Yeah. Um, I think it would be hilarious to do, well, this isn't really changing voices, but I always would go into the sessions, and i go, do we get a very special episode where like, we do an inclamation? <laughs> <laughs> or our, our Christmas episode or something like that. You know, like theme, theme things. You know, I think should do, what I think would be great, because uh, I've been pushing this with Ben 10, because with Ben 10, you know, you can do anything. I would love to see a, a Transformers musical. Uh, <laughs> we talked about that. We're talking about one for YouTube right now, actually. Yeah, it's yeah. a joke we talked about. That's you like, wrong! Yeah. <laughs> I think I Starscream, Starscream would be great. Oh, yeah. I'm doing a Transformers yeah. adaptation yeah. of West Side Story. And <laughs> Lita, I just met a girl named Lita. <laughs> Or we can do the old Warner Brothers. When you're a jet, you're a jet for life. <laughs> no, the last con I did, they were asking the same question, and, we, and I said, well, it should be like that old Warner Brothers thing. Everybody's doing the Michigan Right. right. <laughs> I'd like to play a character named Haywire, uh, Transformer. Uh, one of my mentors was Dawes Butler, and he... Uh. He uh, and I used to do voices together all the time. But uh, he had this one voice, it was like, <laughs> you know, like this. So I thought, you know, why don't they have a little comedy relief in there? You know, and every once in a while I was bringing Haywire <laughs> and have him be like the assistant to somebody or for something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd always wanted to bring back the old, the old Robert Stack voice. For Ultra Magnus, because I just love that voice. And you can find it on the next edition of Unsolved Mystery. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, uh, I you know I always kind of I, I love Bumblebee growing <laughs> up, and you know Dan Gilbert did such a great job, but I, I always wanted that job. I always wanted that voice, and I think for for Transformers the game, uh, I got to kind of step into a stranger voice uh, for Mixmaster. Which I don't know if anybody actually heard. It was in the PSP version of the game, and you know I studied intently. I studied the voice, and I wanted to do it justice. And I get in the studio, and they're like, you know, give us Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> that happens all the time. Oh, yeah. So, so, so I'm in the studio, and and they're like, let, let, let's hear your mix master, and they're like, yeah, that's perfect. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so seriously, this is what Mixmaster sounded like. 
I they do that all the time. You go in, you well rehearse, they, they, they tell you what they want, and they change their mind. Oh yeah, it's, and you have to do a world class performance in thirty seconds. I, I had studied, I'd studied so hard coming up with this voice for Starscream, and you know, it was going to be just a white British accent. <laughs> I said, "Say so you want Starscream to sound like this?" <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I needed a change of pants at that point. <laughs> You know, it's kind of a metaphor for life because you have to be ready for anything. Yeah, yeah, true. And that's totally our business. Yeah, I was ready to lose my job at that moment. <laughs> when, I got, when I got hired for XCOM, we went. He he hired me for the uh, for the trailers first. So I went in. He said we want want something Peter Cullen-ish, uh, and I really liked what I've already heard. So I don't want to go through all the red tape of going through acting when I already know what I want. So we did all the trailers. But oh, it's, it's completely emotionless. It's like glow commander. And it's just straightforward. Let me go ahead and record the game. He's like, no, he sounds too heroic. So I and he just on the spot had to change everything. He's like, give us more David Silva. Yeah, he just <laughs> uh, he just he said, okay, well, what do you think? And I love it when they ask me what I think instead of, instead of telling me, you know, do it like this but sideways. And uh, so I, I, first thing that popped in my mind was the general from Austin Powers. So all I could think of was London, England. <laughs> they're like, hey, that's great. Let's go with that. I'm like, <laughs> However, once you solidify the character on that first day, it has to be identical for 40 episodes. Yep. And they'll, they'll play your reference, you can jump in again. Yeah, and the hard part is, when you come up with a voice sometimes, you don't know what kind of emoting you're going to have to do. So, you have to be able to laugh and cry and pitch a fit as any particular voice you come up with. And if you cannot do that, the scripts, you know, you're not in charge of writing the scripts. They're going to put you in, in places you're not aware of when you first create the voice. And so you have to have that kind of elasticity and versatility of all your emotions. So that's why many of uh, uh, voice actors seek out shrinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also have to be able to scream and die and sing in character as well. So once you set in stone, you better be able to do it all. My favorite is be impaled from the left. <laughs> you're being crushed by a boulder on the left, you're running to the right. I had a director tell me to die in a German accent and then die in a French accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a director... Oh! Ooh. Oh. I was, I was oh. the story oh. the way and I, I uh, did the rats in Total Recall with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the guy comes in, he goes, no, I've been thinking about this all weekend. What if the main rat was from France. What would that sound like? <laughs> and I said, do you want it cartoon? No, I want it real. So I'm thinking, okay, we're, we got some problems here. <laughs> I kind of I kind of go, oh. <laughs> and he goes, I'm not sure about that first part, but I like that second part. <laughs> so well, how about if I just try to do him a little higher pitched and a little bit uh, more excited? Yes, let's try that. So you don't know what the directors are going to come up with. And I also love how, I mean, of course, it's really a dream come true still, I think, for, for most of us to be cast in a series that's going to run a long time. You get an, do an audition, you show up the first day, and they completely change it. And you think, wow, I was cast based on thin air. Yeah. <laughs> because when, I, when I first auditioned for uh, Ben 10, in 2006 we started, and uh, they, they, they wanted Grandpa Max to be kind of a um, folksy sort of voice, and just a hint of a twang. So I, I was, Ben, Ben, you know, the Omnitrix is not a toy, so you got to be careful with it. We did three episodes, and each week, as we were doing the episodes, they kept saying, Say, okay, let's let's stick with it. Said, that's what because that's what they want. So we did three weeks, and I knew it after the third week they weren't happy. So I'm saying, okay, well there goes my job. I'm done. I, I suck as Grandpa Max. Uh, and then they at the end of the uh, at the, the end of that episode they said, you know what? Let's try try it without any accent at all. You know, not, no region at all. So I just I just said, okay, Ben. You know, the, the Omnitrix is not a toy. You gotta be serious about it, son. Okay? They said, all right, that's, I think we like that. So I went away thinking that they weren't gonna call me again. So I went back the fourth episode, and we had to redo all the first three because that's what they wanted to go with. So it's one of those situations where 
you do your, your audition is what they ask for. Boy, that's rare though, Paul, because most often they'll replace they'll you. They'll replace you. Well, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's, I, it's I, true. They really do. There's this one show, I, one series. I got the first episode, and they replaced me. Action Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. I did one. They went, no, somebody else. That's fine. No, when I when I did RoboCop, the um, the sidekick Agent Minor um, went through three actors, female actors. First one did it ten episodes. They fired her. Second one did another ten episodes. They fired her. And Akiko Morrison came in, and she told me the story. Because she had to go back, and a lot of it was already animated. She had to do 20 episodes by herself. Yeah. And she said some days she was just in tears because she had to match what was already there and sound like herself. Yeah. And then also do new episodes too. So some days she'd do like four episodes a day. One more thing about Ben 10. Does uh, anybody know Ben 10? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, well. Yeah. I know you're. With Ben 10. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's about that whole thing. We started out, Ben was 10 years old. In the, for the first couple of seasons. And then they decided to ch change it up and make him 15 years old um, to, to grow with the, with the audience. So what they did was they recast everybody. Uh, they brought in new, new directors, new producers, new writers. Um, so after God knows if you age five years, you've got to replace everybody. So what happened was... The writers. <laughs> they did that. Well, there are a couple of different reasons they do that. Uh, and then it changed again. They did. Uh, we did Ben Ten. Then we did Ben Ten plus five Ultimate <laughs> Alien. <laughs> then Ben Ten Alien Force, and now we're Ben Ten Omniverse. And th we've had three directors. We've had uh, three different sets of writers and um, and producers. And after the first couple of years, they moved him uh, five years up. And anybody who I told the story to last night, I apologize because you're going to hear it again. Uh, they called me in to re-audition for Grandpa Max. Really? I had to re-audition for the character I created. Uh, <laughs> and they said, well, 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 it's five years later, so Grandpa Max, maybe he's, maybe he's not as tough as he was. Maybe he's older. Maybe his voice is weaker. So I said, okay, Ben. Ben, the, you know, the Omnitrix, blah, 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 blah. And they said, well, no, maybe he's got more gravel in his voice. Try that. All right, Ben. Maybe the Omnitrix, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and finally they said, well, you, well, it's only five years and adults. <laughs> and they went right back. I know adult's voice doesn't change that much in five years. No, it doesn't. So I'm still, I'm the only one from the original uh, that's been through all the episodes, uh, not all the episodes, but all the incarnations. D. Bradley Baker was away for a while, now he's back. Um, and um, Steve Bloom was away for a while, now he's back. And uh, I, I love the new the new version because they bring the old and the new together. But it's one of those deals where you go in the audition all over again. We'll sometimes show up for auditions. I've seen this. Uh, I showed up for an audition once that said, look for David Sobolov type. <laughs> uh, and I did the audition. I said, was I David Sobolov enough for you? <laughs> no, we didn't want that David Sobolov. We wanted a David Sobolov type. <laughs> that happened to Robbie Wrist. We're looking for a Robbie Wrist type, and then he didn't get the job. <laughs> Michael Bell. Michael Bell created a, a, a commercial eons ago. And he did it for me, I don't know, maybe 8, 10, 12 years called, uh, it was Parquet. Oh, yeah. Butter. yeah. Butter. You Butter. know what his house is called? Los Residualis. Right. <laughs> that was his feature. Well, they brought it back, and uh, they had him audition, and he said, what? I've been doing it all these years. What? He didn't get it. They gave it to somebody else. It's like, you never know. And look, Poor in Transformers, in Transformers <laughs> games, uh, in uh, Paul uh, uh, Cybertron, there's, there's Perceptor in there, but I never got a call. They don't want to negotiate with anybody that has a name bigger than the product or as big as the product. Uh, but I got a call on a Friday saying you're the new Mickey Mouse, and then they called me up on Monday and said, you know, we decided to speed another guy up. So, uh, you know, literally, don't go out and buy a car until you cash the check. <laughs> I have been casting stuff. I was on the way to the studio, and they called me, so they recast it. That's okay. That, that <laughs> happened to me, actually, too, similar with Mickey Mouse. They were looking for, I guess, Disney backups at one point, and I had gotten through the final stages and a letter of intent for, uh, for and it was this wonderful experience. Like, oh, I'm going to work for Disney. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Anyone who's worked for Disney says, actually, well, I'm going to work for Disney. <laughs>
Please <laughs> uh, oh, oh, don't air that part of it on you. <laughs> <laughs> Excluding I that love, Pixar aspect. I love working for Pixar and Disney. They are the best. <laughs> they really, Pixar is actually the best. I got a dream come true recently. I worked for uh, Disney doing uh, voices, animatronic characters in one of their theme parks. Oh, cool. In uh, Hong Kong, Mystic Manor. If you ever go to Hong Kong, let me know how <laughs> Oh wait, 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 sorry about that. It's so Disney. At the end of the session, it's so Disney. I can't even say why it's Disney, but you'll know when I tell you. They came out like very, very formally, like they were serving dinner. The very last thing we did with plates. And on the plates were combs. And on the combs were pieces of wax paper. This is very 1935. We had to sound like bugs. Now, <laughs> would have done it. But having the combs and the wax paper was, really, wow. was totally cute. And they were clean. They hadn't been using them to comb their hair or anything. <laughs> you know what? That doesn't sound like Disney to me. <laughs> it was a little bit budgety. There was, was a little bump. There should have been a little home. real cream in there somewhere. Hal, uh, were you there when we were doing the Insecticons, when we had to eat buildings and stuff? And yeah. That, there was a, a moment, uh, I've I told the story once before, I think, but you're talking about the bugs. Uh, during the, the movie, uh, we all, we, everybody had to we'd do your own character and then you'd all do you know, group stuff. So at one point, Voila. the Insecticons were eating uh, buildings and metal and whatnot, and uh, there was a moment where, when you're in front of an, uh, a microphone, when you're, like right now, uh, when you're performing, you're almost never doing this. Especially when you're standing up and you're using your body and you're moving around, kicking your, your mouth there, but you know, you're just All the physicality, yeah. Exactly, you gotta, you gotta put everything into it. And there was a moment when we were doing that, there was maybe six or eight of us in the room at, at our own mics, and we're all going, <laughs> and everybody had their own way of, of eating and doing things with their hands, you know, oh, those are my mouth, my, my mouth, <laughs> you know, all that comes, and I remember looking up and, and seeing this, and everybody's doing it at the same time, and it was so ridiculous. <laughs> I think I think, Paul, we should do that right now. Let's all do it right now. Now that looked ridiculous, didn't it? <laughs> and they paid us to do that. <laughs> So um, who's they, the crazy one? They paid me to I, buzz a comb. I got paid to belch on cue. <laughs> that was a big call to my mom. Hey, okay. remember when you gave me trouble? Everything is research and development. Okay, let us have it. I thank you. I'll thank you very much. Much. That'll be five hundred dollars. Less residuals. Unless you're Maurice Mark. And ten percent for my age. Hey, uh, uh, residuals. The weird, oh, before you say that, I just yeah. want to interject something. The weirdest job I ever had was probably um, something dinosaurs. What was it called in the 90s? And I had to play a kissing dinosaur. He had no dialogue. He just... <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Cadillacs and dinosaurs. No, no. It was... I can't remember. But I didn't ever see that until Chevys and VWs. But it's just weird to be cast to just kiss. The Golden Girls. <laughs> <laughs> On Kid Video, I played a laughing cane that uh, Master Blaster owned, and all I did was laugh incessantly. <laughs> Michael Clark Duncan, the last performance he ever did, I'm so honored. Uh, he is in the Guardians of the Galaxy that gets put in all these Marvel shows, and he's Groot, and his only line is, I am Groot. And that's all he ever says. But they recorded about 50 different versions yeah. of that, and uh, they're going to keep him, hopefully, in the show. That'd be great. No, I it? am Groot. No, I am Groot. <laughs> uh, we were talking, about said residuals. I just posted something uh, a while ago, about a week ago on my Facebook page. Feel free to feel friend me if you haven't friended me. Uh, and it's a residual check I got. Outside. I won't say what the company's uh, from, but just so you know, that residuals don't mean that, you know, we're all rich. <laughs> My residual was, I posted it for, I said, what's wrong with this picture? And it was a picture of the envelope with a 38 cent stamp that was paid, uh, paid to send it to me. And the residual was for one cent. <laughs> oh, 
You get a lot of that stuff. The Screen what? Actors Guild is losing so much money. It makes no sense. But, well, I was told though, that the producers do that intentionally. They could roll everything together. No, they can't actually. One chest. I don't, no, I don't mean that. I mean, yeah. they'll put it in. Oh, uh, they could roll it in. Yeah. yeah. But they, well, once it's generated, they have to pay us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it was 38 cents plus all the time it took to put it together and to hire somebody to send it for one penny. <laughs> You're welcome to cable. <laughs> <laughs> you better not spend that all at once. <laughs> Someone said I was overpaid. Y'all still get residuals for the original G1 stuff like that? Uh, well, it, well, for a while we weren't. They were airing for a long time uh -huh. on the hub. And we weren't getting anything until someone said, Hey, wait a minute. We should be getting like a dollar or two for that. So, because that's what happens a lot of times. Because what happens is one company sells it to another company, sells it to another company, and then that last company doesn't pay you. And then you go after the first company and they say, wait a minute, somebody's making it because they're still advertising on it, they're still selling it. So we should be getting a, a piece of, you know, and it, it's not much money at all. It's like you know, five or six bucks an episode. Maybe it's like a matter of how big is your lawyer compared to theirs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lose lose situation. But, but the, you know, finally the union went after them and yeah, said, oh yeah, I guess we should be paying them something. It's like when Ted Turner bought all the Hanna-Barbera library and didn't pay any residuals for two years and the Screen Actors Guild went after him with the vicious teeth that the Screen Actors Guild maintains. And they said, you should be paying these residuals. And he said, I didn't know I had to. Okay, we'll give you one more year residual free just get your house in order but then you have to pay residuals so they got three years out of not paying residuals right which hurt frank welker terrifically. <laughs> anyway here's a question all right um hi all right i i know that this probably doesn't apply to um movie trailers and stuff, but when you're doing a character, how aware of the overall story are you, or do you just see like the pages that you're doing that day? They'll give us the whole script in a few weeks in advance or so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, for your animation, you wow. a couple days. We get it one on Monday, I got it the night before. Maybe that's the way it works. Really? Point. For Ben 10, you get it the night, get it the night before? Yeah, I guess I did, I did when I did um, Kaijudo, sometimes they would get kind of late with the scripts. And, Hanna Barbera, we'd show up and they'd give us the script and it yep. would be cold reading. Cold You'd reading. never get a chance to see what was yeah. going on. But you know, but once we've hopefully if we read the script, you know, you get an idea of what's going on. But uh, some of my characters, though, this is sort of I think what you're getting at. Um, Shockwave is very isolated and on purpose. I mean, I read I read what was going on, but I didn't really even pay attention as an actor in my mind anything else that was going on except what he had to worry about, <laughs> just to keep it more real. Yeah, I I, I always read the script. I always want to. I, I want to know what's going on. I want to know where I'm fitting in. You have to, really. Have to. Yeah, especially with with Ben Ten, because now I do four or five different characters. So it, you know, so you get a chance to really, you know, figure out where you fit. Um, plus, the, some some of the writing, it's some of the writing is really good. You know, it really is. I mean, the, the research these folks put into the, their uh, their scripts blow me away. Uh, video games, of course, you don't. You know, I've done all three God of Wars, and you get it when you, you know, they give you your part when you get there. Um, because there's no way of reading, it, you know, the entire thing, you know, it, it's just too voluminous, you know. I find that even more challenging than animation because you've got to come up with all these, sometimes multiple characters, cold. Yep. The characters are cold. The scripts are cold. I've been handed 70 pages. Go. One, one take is in no time. You do one take. So, I did. I did a game called Fallout Three, and I, I'm, I'm like 15 different characters in, in the game. And when I got, I had no idea what I was doing. You go, you think, okay, you're gonna do a character or two, maybe three. Um, so I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready. And I get there, and they said, oh well, here's here's your part. And it was like that. It was this huge amount of work, all just my lines, no no nothing in between. So it's just one line. Then I say the next line, I say the next line. And you usually do two or three different readings of each one. And if, if uh, they're happy with one of those three takes, you move on. If not, you do three more. The general, so with this one, it was straight, pretty much straight through. But what they did to keep from having to pay extra money for more than three voices, actually more than two voices, um, they said, well, don't change the voice much. <laughs> Just change the attitude. <laughs> So I'm throughout the game as these different characters that pop up and different things that happen. 
but it's pretty much the same same sort of voice, you know. Um, but, you know so you, and you get it. They give it to you when you get there, and then you, you fly with it. One of the things that I love as an actor is being able to dive into a role and really create something dynamic and have a backstory and have all these wonderful things to do and memories and experiences to draw from. Some people go into it a lot more hardcore, but uh, like for example, I'm working on a film right now called You're Dead, hence the Mohawk. And I've got fake tattoos and black nail polish and guy liner. And I've got this ridiculous accent that's mostly made up and mostly Captain Jack Sparrow meets uh, you know, this, that, and the other. Spike. Yeah, so, <laughs> Spike. so, you know, this obnoxiously lascivious character. And, and I've got all these things where he's essentially immortal living in this town. And I've got all these fake tattoos and they change every single scene because we couldn't get a regular tattoo artist to come in and, you know, do it. So I explained away for the character that uh, because he's immortal, Every time he tries to get a tattoo, it just goes away. So he has to do fake tattoos to look cool. So, you know, that's one of the things that you, you really enjoy going through these experiences with and creating characters. And sometimes with, with video games, like, like Paul was just talking about, you just get lines. You just get lines and they say, go. They'll give you an attitude. You know, you'll say you're, you're angry here or you're calling out or you're war or fighting, that sort of thing. But usually it's just the lines and you go. Can I say something before we, we quit? You can't say No. I want to say, I'm going to say, I have a microphone. I have a microphone. I got to tell you guys, uh, I'm, you guys never cease to amaze me with the fan art that is created, the fan fiction that's created, um, and the videos that you guys uh, put out blow me away. Um, it, uh, you know, stuff that, uh, um, John Paul, uh, John Paul, John Bailey does, and uh, uh, Randall Ng, who's an incredible. Is he here? Uh, no, he's not. Incredible uh, work that he, he you know, turns out. I just did something else for him. Um, it, it's just amazing to me the creativity and the artistry that, that's out there. And I hope you guys know any of you who do that sort of stuff. Me, for I, we, I think we, like three for all of us, we really appreciate it. It just, it's amazing. It's amazing that what, what people do for love and, you know, um, and, and for passion. And uh, it's what, why I do what I do, because I'm passionate about what I do and I love it. But we really appreciate uh, what you guys do out there. It's just, it's amazing. I've never, it's never 30 years it. ago, it was, just, it was just work. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea that this was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, the whole convention thing's really taken off. There's so many conventions now. This is my third in a row, third week in a row convention. I just think it's amazing that you can, you know, have a passion for something, go out and do something, uh, get paid for it, and then people appreciate that. Uh, that that's a level that you don't expect when you get in and, and do these things that we do. And you know, coming to these conventions, I, I've been a regular convention goer. It's it's always incredible. It's always an experience to see how much passion you guys are putting into things, making the artwork with the costumes and everything else. I saw Bumblebee not long ago and I was like, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's so cool to see and, and I think I can speak for everybody here. We appreciate it too. It just, it makes everything that we do so much more uh, awesome. We appreciate you. I was saying last night that, that I none, of, the none, of, you, sir. <laughs> none of this happens in I a vacuum. I too appreciate you, sir. <laughs> yeah. uh, none of this happens in a vacuum. You know, we, we can act and we can be the most brilliant actor in the world, but if nobody sees it, nobody cares, so what? You know, it really is a cooperative sort of effort, you know. Uh, we live for you guys and, you know, you guys live for the work. You know, it's just... It's appreciated. It's not, okay, I, I, it's I, not I, exactly I, like the paparazzi is just chasing these guys around. Uh, <laughs> I, I was in LA at a little studio, a little, uh, Studio City Cafe, and Kevin Michael Richardson and Phil Lamar in the parking lot talking. I was like, I don't know, you're, you're a big strong man. <laughs> There's a paparazzi 10 feet away trying to get a picture of Vanessa Hudgens eating a sandwich inside, so they don't know real talent. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons we love what we do. <laughs> Kevin's the only guy in Hollywood who comes and greets me and picks me up. <laughs> you guys all have like a, uh, incredible senses of humor. I think, like, if anything, I'm picking up from this. Would, could you guys maybe go down real quick and say who uh, your favorite comedian is, and maybe um, what uh, an actor, like a not a voice actor, but a, a regular actor, regular actor, 
<laughs> they eat lots of fiber. <laughs> who, uh, who inspires you and or has a voice or something you feel is, is, is really uh, impassioned or inspiring you? No. I gotta think. I'll go way back. Mine, mine is Jack Benny. I always love Jack Benny. When I was tiny, I think, he, I think throughout history he will pass always because there's something about an everyman aspect about him. Uh, I just sat down with uh, Albert Brooks uh, about a week and a half ago and spent two hours talking about comedy with him. I like Albert Brooks a lot. Mel Brooks. I love Mel Brooks. Uh, Carl Reiner. But I'm an old fart, so I go for the old guys. Uh, that's what I said, and I stand by it. Well, Mel Blake. You know, yeah. who can beat Mel? Well, Dawes is awesome, too. You know, the old time ago. But Mel was like, he yeah. was the god. Do you know, you ever hear the story about him in his last couple of years? I'm sure he, 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 he never stopped, man. He had an oxygen tank and a cigarette. Cigar? <laughs> cigar in the studio? Yeah, yeah. He, he'd take a puff of his yep. cigar or cigarette and a puff of his oxygen and, what's up, Doc? <laughs> Kept going right to the end. Ah, uh, sponsors. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, for comedian, he strikes. For comedian, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm from the, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, for me, um, Richard Pryor uh, was. He was great. He was. Uh, he did things. It was way ahead of his time. Uh, he said things. That people said, oh, "Yeah, you say that," but it was all real. Um, I never found a false moment in, in things that he, he said. It, poor man was, you know, had his demons, but I thought he was just a one of a kind. Yeah, I'm a, I was a born and raised on uh, Jonathan Winters and uh, oh. uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Bill Cosby. I always loved this. We didn't have TV, so we had to listen to records. So I had to listen to my brother and my friend and Daryl and and Peter Keller was my always my biggest inspiration as far as voice voice actors because I just he just had that. That cadence and that humility and that power and that such a small little package, but he was just such a great performer. And, Don't say he has a small package. He had a small package. He small package. Just around. Or how about Bob Newhart in his early stuff? Oh, he's yeah. so dead. Yeah. 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 Hilarious. Any, any of these guys who were one of a kind, I mean, they were really special. Oh, and I love like the improv stuff. I think the guys from Who's Line. Yeah. Gary Anthony Williams is on there now. I love that show. I love anybody that. I mean, then these guys, uh, some of the voice actors, Chris Lott was a comedian. Uh, Tom Kenny was a stand up comedian. I, I draw a lot of uh, inspiration from people who either I can relate with directly or who I've met. Um, in terms of comedians, I'll get a couple of laughs on this one. Uh, Dane Cook. Uh, I, I met Dane uh, years ago at the DC Improv, and this was before he like completely flew up and took off. And I was in awe of his energy and his charisma. Is he a comedian? He is. He was. <laughs> he, his resume. This guy was going for two hours straight, just nonstop. I'm like, what is he on? This is amazing. And. He was he was so funny, and I went up to him afterwards and I asked him how he maintained that. Just you know, as an actor, I wanted to know like what was his secret. And he said, "I love what I do. I love what I do. I get such a such a kick out of hearing the audience laugh. I just need to keep going." And that clicked with me. Um, so in terms of a comedian, Dane Cook, I, I drew some inspiration <coughs> from. Um, in terms of actors, I'm a huge Johnny Depp fan. Um, you know, he's been he's had such a versatile career. Um, he's amalgamated himself to so many different roles, whether good or bad. Um, I just I love the opportunity to step into a different character and uh, really transform myself, transform. And uh, I, I think that's that's a huge quality to have uh, in Hollywood. It's something that I'd like to emulate. So absolutely, Johnny Depp for me. And I also was a big fan of Pablo Francisco. All because oh. I knew we each other so much. <laughs> tortilla boy. Ready to come to your birthday? People find out how every single celebrity makes love if you listen to Pablo Francisco. Anything <laughs> <laughs> else? else? Yo. I'm thinking when, because when I went up to the mic, I was going to ask you guys about how you stand, because. Uh, Jack Angel said when he was doing uh, Super Friends, you know, this is and Wally too. He said you couldn't just stand there. He said you had to act 
like a superhero kid, you know, Superman voice, things like that. And it, so I'm going, thinking along the line, did anybody also, because we kind of talked about that, but pranks, because Michael Bell told me when he went in for snorks, he said you had to sound like you were underwater. So he was trying to drink a glass of water and trying oh, to talk. God. And then they said, well, why are you doing this? It's much easier. So did you guys ever have pranks or anything played on you when you went to audition or something funny happened while you're in the studio? Well, it's not pranks so much. So I experienced Transformers Prime as just a comedy explosion. The entire time you're there, it's a comedy <laughs> show. Especially, especially with um, Steve Blue and everybody. Frank. They're always doing like old, old like 1960s routines. Like Peter and Frank together. Well, Frank one time in a Transformers uh, show uh, nearly got a guy fired who was uh, Wally's new assistant because he was making white noise sounds on his mic and they, they couldn't figure out where that was. Where could he sound effects? Oh, yeah. Did you do a cricket? And you think there's a cricket somewhere? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, Frank's the only guy I know that you can say, like, we need an eagle, and he'll say, which kind? <laughs> does, it, does, does it have white feathers or brown feathers? <laughs> he has like 300 birds, doesn't he? Anything. <laughs> Does it ever, uh, if you want to uh, have a hard time getting through a session, have Rob Paulson uh, um, and um, uh, John DiMaggio in the John DiMaggio is hilarious. Dima yeah. Everyone, uh, uh, when we record, uh, every, usually mo most people, sta most people, not every, most people stand mm -hmm. at the microphone. DiMaggio, not DiMaggio. John is always, sits mostly. He's sitting he's and he's always, he's always has his iPad with him. And uh, and when he's not, he's okay. He's over here uh, playing golf. <laughs> John, and then, John, you're up. Oh yeah! <laughs> Rats up. Okay, water. He's <laughs> 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 always playing the game. We yeah. have, but he's always there, and he's so darn good. You, you want to get angry with him, but you can't. He's so good. You know what John's really good at? I mean, you think you think he's all comedy when he does a villain. Oh, he's he's chilling, man. Yeah. He's also he's, he's a big, big guy. guy. He, he he can be scary. Yeah. You ever work with Stuart? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Stu <laughs> Stu Rosen. Stu Rosen. Yes. What? I'll do, I'll tell why did you do that? Can you do Stu? Okay. I was working with Stu doing a, a, a cartoon. I don't remember what the cartoon was. But I remember we all had, when we came in first, before we sat down for the read, we had to stand up and want to walk around the, the room. As our characters. And, no, as a color. As our characters, as a color. <laughs> Stu was, uh, he had a little show called Dusty's Treehouse as a child, and I think he took that into his adulthood a little strong. Uh, but we were doing... <laughs> I'm seen. Uh, we were doing a thing called Defenders of the Earth, and I got to play Ming the Merciless' son, Prince Kretan. <laughs> and we had to walk around as our characters. So, for just because it was for <coughs> poops and giggles, I just decided, you know, I'm going to give Prince Kretan a club foot. So I started walking around with a club foot, and he goes, "What are you doing?" <laughs> And I said, I'm walking as Prince Crotan. And he goes, but he doesn't have a club foot. And I said, in my version, he does. <laughs> he wasn't real fond of that line, but you know, it was like, I don't know what walking around as Prince Crotan does for the make the performance that much different. That's something you would do in theater school or uh, maybe, maybe it's a it's a one on one beginning right. class for somebody who's never done anything yeah i did a voiceover once a, a commercial just a commercial well there was a series of commercials husband and wife in uh, a um, which were you <laughs> it was a stretch i was the husband <laughs> it was a store called the broadway <laughs> this week at the broadway you know that sort of thing but it, that was the announcer part and it was a husband and wife hey honey yeah, let's go down to Broadway. I hear they have the rugs on sale. Oh, cool. Let's do it, baby. Okay, that was it. That kind of thing. And we had like eight or nine to do that day. I go in. It was our first session. And they said, oh, well, the woman who's playing your wife is in, in the booth. And I looked and I saw nobody. It was like the, you could see there was a glass there and there's nobody in there. So I walked in and she was on the floor, prone, doing ha, 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 
doing all these vocal exercises. And, it was, and it, all we were going to do was talk like this. <laughs> and then I found out later uh, that it was her first job, her first voiceover job. And she was totally freaked out. I didn't give her a hard time. I gave her a hard time years later because we're still good friends. Uh, and she's a wonderful actress, Susie. Telling my wife who it is, Susie, Susie Duff. Um, but like, oh, okay, now I know what I'm working with. <laughs> my, my funniest experience that I had, anybody know who Chris Parnell is? He does so many yeah. voice actor work, he was on SNL. His father, Jack Parnell, is a local Memphian and a voice actor. He does Kroger and all these commercials and he was the WMC TV5 voiceover guy. Uh, he's a fairly big guy and he's, uh, he's up in a few years. And when I was going in to record my very first demo with the company that I was with, he apparently had a lot of burritos that morning, and uh, there's not a lot of ventilation in those boots. So I had to come in there to record a demo after he'd come out. He didn't. He thought I was over at the ISD lines. He didn't know I was going to actually be in the booth. Apparently, he had just spread everything everywhere. So that was. Uh, uh, that was uh, so you're telling me right now. It's great like, when you have to, and you know things come out. <laughs> <laughs> but that reminds me of things you can control. As you're going to be a voice actor, you never have cologne, you never have perfume, um, you always take a bath, leave yeah. out, because you're such close proximity to other people. <laughs> but then there are some, like, like Chris, that you had to throw a towel to in the middle of the oh, session. Wow. Chris Latta, I don't, he was a sweater. <laughs> Boy, he was a sweater. I, I always thought of more of a, as a car carnigan type sweater. Well, well, let's put it this way, he was not a V-neck. <laughs> he, uh, he would just, literally Michael Bell was working beside him one time and he said, can you get this man a towel? Because like, he was everywhere. Play off. Well, I always have to have a towel just to get the head. <laughs> well, you know, I sweat a lot. But depending upon the character, I'm a spitter. You're screaming sometimes too. Yeah, well, when, when you're, you know, you know when, when you really got to put it out there, there'll be times when I need to tell the wife off my script because it, it gets pretty wet. <laughs> Have we gone over or is it okay? Well, we're 10 minutes over. It's up to you guys. Anybody have any more questions or are you sick of us? I was wondering, um, as Colonel Campbell in the Middle of Your Talent series, you yeah. playing such an integral role in it, uh, is that maybe an exception to that? The cool thing about that one, especially the first time we did it, it was one of the few times during a video game that you actually were in the same room. Like, Snake and I were there. David Hayter and I were there in the room together. Uh, we got a chance to talk about it. Uh, that was an exception, to talk about it a lot, because this is back in 1999, the first time, the first one, uh, when we first did it. I think it was 90, 98, 99. I think it was 98. 98. Um, uh, usually, you're in there by yourself with the director who tells you, okay, this is what's happening here. This is how, you know, what we want, what we're looking for. Uh, but with that one, Chris Zimmerman, who, um, who directed, who's directed all of them, and he was wonderful, um, uh, gave us time to talk, to understand what's going on. Jennifer Hale, when we got to work with her, she was there, and Mei Ling, Kim, I guess, we, you know, they, we were all in the room together, which is really cool. Uh, so that one was different. Uh, although there was, in Metal Gear 2, have you done 2? Yeah. Okay. In 2, there's one point where my character uh, it, well, the colonel. Don't give the game away. I won't give the game away. <laughs> but there's a point where he starts saying things that make no sense. And what, what they did with that, with me, they didn't tell me what was going on. They didn't tell me any, they didn't want to let, let me know what was happening either. I was saying, why am I saying this? He said, don't worry about it, just say it. They gave me this one sheet with all the bizarre stuff about, you know, I was driving home one Thursday and there was an orange light in the sky and all this stuff. And there was all these things. And that's where I said, um, I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in flat jaw space does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors, 61. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> what that meant. And they said, don't worry about it, just say it. <laughs> you, you didn't get it, did you? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I had I no got idea. It. You guys <laughs> no, I, I, I can come back. I'll have what he's having. I can come back. <laughs> <laughs> Jump out for just a second. I'll be right back. Okay.
Is it something I no, said? Hold on, no, 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 you know. On that note, have you ever met Hideo Kojima in person? Yes. I figured. It was during two. And what he did was he brought us a one sheet that he signed for us. This is before he started going around signing everything. So for a while it was it was worth something. Now he signed <laughs> everything for everyone. Uh, now it was very cool. It was very cool. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the rumor that I heard was, that I'm really bummed about, uh, is that uh, Campbell may not be back, although they well, they were talking about bringing David back, but now they went with um, uh, Keeper Sutherland. Yeah, Keeper Sutherland. Um, but the rumor was that since the Japanese voice actor who did um, Campbell passed away, out of uh, in honor of him, that he wouldn't bring Campbell back. So I'm kind of bummed about that. If it's true, I'm hoping it's not true. Interesting sidelight. Uh, Jerry Lewis, very famous in France. <laughs> a genius in France. Yeah, not so much here. But over in France, he's revered. People don't know that all of his films bombed after the guy that dubbed him in France died. So that's the, that's the importance of the guy who dubs you in a foreign country. My wife uh, quit The Simpsons for a couple of years, and she got letters from people who had dubbed her in other countries saying, thanks a lot. <laughs> Dubbing somebody is, 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 can be really fun and can also be kind of sad. Uh, my first ADR work was on a film called Demolition Man. Uh -oh. um, and uh, <laughs> I was hired to go in and revoice um, a, a, a young helicopter pilot uh, because the guy looked great, but he had a voice you know, that was kind of up here. He was this big guy, maybe, you know, he was sitting down, but he looked like a big guy. And he was a, a marine uh, pilot of a helicopter. And there's a scene where Stallone is he's standing in the back, they're going into the, into the city or whatever. And it's, it's, I don't know what the lines are. But they had me go in because they wanted, they wanted the guy to be a little tougher. Yeah, okay, what do you want, what do you want us to do now? Uh, oh, whatever. So I did it, and I just thought about this young actor who must have been really thrilled to say, Mom, Dad, I'm in this movie. We're still alone. Demolition Man, you wait and you see it. I got this great scene. <laughs> and then he goes and hears somebody else's voice coming out of his body. He said, did you hear that? I sound great. <laughs> I didn't even know how good I was. <laughs> you cameras make me sound like Paul Heidi. <laughs> I sound tough, don't I? <laughs> That's the other thing that's great about voiceover, though. Yeah, you know, I can be six foot four, I can be eight hundred years old, whatever. Um, and I'm not six foot. I'm not. I'm not Colonel Campbell, um, who's a big marine. But I can be. Welcome, oh, voiceover. It's cool. I always wondered why in Transform in the Terminator that they couldn't get rid of that glitch, but they could have a guy who could do anything else. <laughs> what is that all about? I should have redone that movie with the guy that did Hercules Goes Mad. Hi, David! How was it? Oh, that was great. <laughs> hey, David, I don't know if you noticed, your mic number is number two. <laughs> oh! Well played, well played. We're all human. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> What did I miss? Yeah. You mentioned uh, Rob Paulson earlier. I was wondering, uh, what do you, uh, you guys work with him on and how is he to work with? Oh my God, he's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> he's the most unprofessional actor I've ever worked with. He has no talent. Uh, and he's an absolute jerk. Um, now, I love Ronnie. Uh, we, we did a movie together back in the 80s called Steward of School. Uh, where Rob played a way over the top a young man. He's the only, no, he's, there are two guys who go to stewardess school. It was one of those, you know, TNA shows, uh, movies. Um, 
and he, he was an over-the-top uh, gay guy. Uh, he was hilarious in it. Uh, so we go way back. We go back to Hanna Barbera days, and the great thing is now he recurs on uh, on Ben Ten, so I get to work with him pretty regularly. He's the best. You know, the guy is he's he's so good, and he's so outgoing, um, and he also like all of us, we he really appreciates how lucky he is and how lucky we all are. The the guys that I and there are a few of them. I, I don't want to lie. There are a few actors, uh, voice actors, just like anybody else, who really think they deserve everything they got. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I haven't met too many. There are, there are a couple. You should get I mean, they, thank God there are very, <laughs> there are very few. But it always irritates the crap out of me when, when people uh, act like that. Rob, yeah. uh, Rob Paulson, is, he, he has a, a small cameo in another film that I'm uh, producing called Trek Off the Motion Picture. Um, which is based on a Star Trek podcast that goes on road trips to different conventions. It'll be a funumentary, uh, and he was he was hilarious. He was hilarious. He was an amazing guy. No, oh, God, he's an animaniac. Yeah. Yeah. And he's pinky. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And they didn't process his voice. He, that comes out of his face. Oh, it does. <laughs> yeah. Steve, same with Steve Bloom when he does Starscream. That's him. Four feet, no, two feet away from me doing Star Trek. You know, process that. He does Bill Gax and, and, and the same thing. So, my God, how, where does that come from? You know, and he can still speak afterwards. You know, like a normal human being. I did a series uh, with Rob, um, Little Green Men. There was no one, probably nobody saw it. it. Was on Warner Brothers had an internet portal called Entertained of in two thousand, long before anyone had the bandwidth to watch any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, we did that. I have a question. Um, going back to the script, uh, when you guys have all of that literature study, when you have a chance, have any of you or know anyone that has had challenges with reading? And how do you overcome that? Yes. And get through it? Uh, my friend Lee Togar, who did those, uh, he's legally blind, so he memorizes his script the night before. Uh, and, and he really gets screwed up if they change the script on him after <laughs> he actually goes to record. But yeah, he said it's a, it's a very, very hard challenge for him. But he thinks it actually improves his acting because he actually has memorized it and he can act it out better than just reading it off copy. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Dawes Butler uh, taught me how to orchestrate copy, uh, how to mark your, your slight pause, your full pause, where to breathe where to put the uh, diphthongal exchange, things like that, which was really good because if you're sitting someplace and they hand you the paper and you've got just a couple of seconds before you walk in front of the mic, you can get the gist of everything you're trying to say and mark it out and orchestrate it, similar to having uh, like you know the music sheet, if you will, on the words that you're doing. That, I found, is extremely helpful. Have you guys ever had any voice that, you've had, that you've had to do that actually Tears your voice up. Oh, Especially uh, video games. When I did Call of Duty 4, Lieutenant Vasquez, I literally couldn't speak properly for six months. Yes. And I learned to never do that to myself again. Four hour sessions, we were screaming. Yeah, I had to do a liquid plumber commercial. But well, let me tell you, back in the day, back in the old days, when we had to, now it's easy. We got to do four hour sessions. Yeah, you know, back in the world, yeah, third day. Oh, and then we did the Transformers. It was eight, nine hours. Eight hours. <laughs> I was screaming. Were they really eight hours? Oh, oh absolutely. Like, Every single like one. G.I. Joe, eight G. I. Joe hours. And Transformers, uh, eight hours. They were one of the reasons wow. why they changed to four hours. Well, I did early, early. You could work the next day. Early in my career, I did a video game called Homeworld. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. Long, 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 long time ago. We had a, we had a nine-hour session, and they poured me into the cab. I don't even remember falling asleep. Yeah. <laughs> well, I slept 12 hours. Well, now they, they, they have to uh, let you know ahead of time. Uh, one of the things that the, the, the union has done is you, they have to let you know ahead of time if what you're going to be doing is vocally stressful work. So you can prepare for it. <laughs> yeah, how do you sometimes you go in and two, two, exactly. You go and do a, two, you know, two characters. Sometimes they want you to go in and know that you're going to be screaming, you're going to be dying, that sort of thing. In, in God of War, I had to die by <laughs> by having my head uh, slammed in the door. I played a character called Theseus, and I got killed at one point. In one of them, I played Theseus. The other one, I played uh, the Great Digger and, and Zeus. Oh, 
And, but I said, you know, they, they said, you, yeah, you get your head slammed in the door and you have to go, And I said, you know what, after one or two times, I think I'd be gone. And they said, no, no, your thesis. I did. Oh, okay. So he slams my head in the door over and over and over and over and over until finally I, I drop down. But it was one of those deals. So you actually died. <laughs> Uh, you, you're, you're joking, but people do pass out of these sessions. Yeah. Um, yeah. People oh. take to the hospital in sessions. People throw it up in the sessions. I've gotten lightheaded a few times. <laughs> Actually, in my, in my last session for, for Dungeons and Dragons, um, uh, which is already out, which is why I can talk about it. It's a continuing thing. So uh, they, they courteously let me do the, the, the more easy voices at the beginning, and then at the end said, okay, prepare yourself. We're going to start screaming. So I had a, I had this gnome, uh, this evil gnome to do, and there was a dwarf. So you know they're like, okay, we're going to ease you into it. So let's do the dwarf first. And you know the dwarf was uh, much more gruff, sounded a lot like Rip Torn. And uh, you know that was easy to do. And then they're like, okay, now we're going to start screaming. And you die from the left. Ah! And you die from the right. Ah! And you know we just kept going. And, and and you know what? Your your death there, it needs more oomph. <laughs> no more oomph. <laughs> no more oomph. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I need water now. <laughs> it's it's really funny, but it, it does take a toll, and afterwards you're like, man, my voice sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to die more often. <laughs> yeah, I, had, I had a session where I was playing uh, a Russian evil scientist or something like that. And the funny part was that and it wasn't just a producer on the other side of the class. It was actually a client sitting in because she had a session afterwards for McDonald's. So she's sitting in the back behind the producer and the, uh, the client working on my job was in my ear and they could hear him on the other side of the class. I couldn't hear them. I could see Fresh. their faces. And uh, so he's, uh, he said, okay, now, now you die. And I was like, well, how do I die? He said, well, have you ever seen that scene from Indiana Jones? Uh, when their skin melts off and you know, it's, 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 it's basically your, your, your jaw gets ripped off and all you're left with is a, is a ton. I'm like, okay. So I get in there and I'm like, ow, ow, ow. And I look on the other side of the glass and the lady from goes, <laughs> <laughs> I said, like, obviously I did it right. She wasn't really good to go. Often they'll have you do a three, you know, they'll have you a, a, a short laugh, a, a death, medium long, length death, and then a long one. Same thing with, you know, you know, screams. A short scream, medium length, and then a long one. And then sometimes three takes of each of those. Yeah. Yeah. For four hours. I did uh, Predator, uh, Predator 2, and that was nine eight-hour days. And, wow. And every time it was like, okay, now you're in real pain. This time, <laughs> this time you're really in real pain. Now, I don't know if anybody here saw the movie, but there's a scene where Danny Glover cuts off his hand and he cauterizes it in these old folks' bathrooms, breaking up the tile and all this stuff. So he puts that on his on his wound to cauterize it and he does this scream. And so they brought in a 300-pound German boxer who was right beside me. I'm on a 44 BX boom mic and he's on a, a, a I'm sorry, I'm on a 416 boom and he's on a 44 BX which is the old radio mic the big magnetic mic that you would see everybody doing and he's off to the side just going Ooh! at the same time I'm going Bruh! and you know you think you could blend those two together and post but no this was like pre this was when they were rolling the black stuff so, uh, which is tape for all of you. <laughs> we used to call it eight track, but that's another thing. Uh, at any rate, so you know, I had to all day long. I had cashews and uh, carobs and raisins to keep the phlegm up in my voice because, I mean, you know, how often can uh, this guy was it, like getting cut, cutting, screaming, jumping, everything. Each time it had to be completely different. So, and as a result, I now wear TMJ guards at night because I open some locked door in my head, primitive-wise, and I have stalking dreams, and I, uh, I gnash my teeth, so I have to wear the TMJ. Now, explain that to the uh, SAG medical group. <laughs> I find if I can get my voice in the pocket, 
it's a, it's a physical place where I can find a place where I can scream for a while and not hurt myself. Right. It's very hard to scream and not hurt yourself. True. Uh, and, and you know what you said is, is reminding me that sometimes I, I just, without even thinking, I'll drink a lot of milk or, or, or get some cheese just to have phlegm. It's almost like a cushion. It's a, it, yeah, it keeps the velvet when I was screaming. Yeah. That's sort of what I was going to ask. If you know ahead of time that you're having like a strenuous day, what do you guys do? Do you not talk for a while? Yeah, vocal rest is key for okay. me. So uh, on, on Friday, Thursday, I do bourbon and beer. And a pack of cigarettes. And I, I gargle with razor blades. Oh, yeah. but, no, I, um, I had Hulk on Thursday where I did Drax, and then uh, I had a uh, Chris Zimmerman screamy, super screamy audition, and then the, uh, my voice was really trash that day, so the next day while I was flying here, I just didn't say a word to anybody. That helped a lot. Yeah. The cool thing is sometimes you have those sessions, the next day you'll have one in the world that wanted to be down there. Oh. It's like, okay, cool. Works out perfectly. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, the killer is when you have to get up to the top yes. register. It's like then you show up at the show through, three weeks later and your voice isn't, isn't anywhere near that place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, zinc, uh, honey lemon tea, garlic, salt water sometimes. Yeah, uh, everybody has their own thing. Yeah, uh, even Bob Bergen suggested neti pot. It's not that really good. Because I, I got out, an allergy attack right before I had to record for Captain Rex. And I was like, luckily he already sounds like he has sinus problems. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know what a neti pot is? Yeah. Yeah. Not everybody in the room, so that means we have to describe it. So a neti pot, it, it goes into uh, it your nostril and it flushes all the goodness that comes out. So I did a neti pot the first time about a year ago and I was so traumatized. <laughs> but I, although I'm not a doctor, I do occasionally play one on TV. But, um, they say, they really say to put distilled water in those things because oh, yeah. you can get yeah. really sick from yeah. them otherwise. Yeah distilled water and, and, and just whatever nice solution they want to give you but it's it's traumatizing the first time you do it because you're like that came out of me do it with scotch man it really is really cool they really open up man they don't care about the pain out there right now that's just a question here she is back there yes ma'am Improv, well, we're doing it right now. <laughs> Pretty much every time you uh, audition. I mean, a lot of it, because I, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I find that you show up, you do the lines, but it's usually something that you do when you're leaving. Uh, something that you, or little buttons that you add to the end of, of uh, phrases and stuff that, that get you the job. So, yeah, it's scripted out, but improv is, I would say anybody that wants to get into this business, take improv classes. Yeah, it's big time. Yeah, once you're in the session, um, uh, if you're on a show for, that goes for a long time, then they let you play around a little bit. But mostly the time, a lot of times with video games, they want it word for word, depending upon, if, like if it's a Norse saga or something. You, you don't play around with it. You, you do, do the lines. The more serious characters. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but there are times when, uh, like with, um, um, I don't know, I just, just in it, Ratchet and Clank. I play a character, Ratchet and Clank, that they they encourage us. There are two characters, uh, Zephyr and, and Clank, these two old robots. And they encourage us to, you know, to improv, to play around. And they, they, they just lay it in. I but did, usually, no. I did a whole part recently that is an NDA still, so I can't talk about it. To me, I rarely do comedy, so I loved it. And one of the, one of the sections was describe your day, and she would like tell me like certain parts of my day, and I just have to do a riff. <laughs> well, you should be getting paid for, for writing, pretty much. <laughs> That's one thing that they, uh, especially for auditions. Now, what what Hal was saying was re is really important, uh, but one thing they don't want you to do is to. You go in for an audition and say, okay, we'll just make something up for the audition. Because there have been times, it happens more with commercials, where they'll t you won't get the job, but you'll see the spot, and it'll be everything that you did. Be, so you basically wrote the spot for them. So yeah, now you're talking about Deke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, oh, I was going to say something, but you were still talking. Uh, yeah, I actually did one recently where... Um, Sometimes it's just a mental thing. Sometimes I've gotten hired more often just from making the client laugh uh, and just mental things. I always stick with what they what they give us for the first take, but I usually do three takes. And I recently did one where I had to do uh, a dog show announcer, and I really don't watch dog shows. <laughs> it was very quiet. You know, it was all dog showy. 
And I just kind of ran out of ideas. I was like, you know what, what if John Madden did a dog? <laughs> <laughs> what do you got here? You got your shit right here, you got the brick wall right here. And I don't you put these two dogs together. We're gonna have a, you're gonna have a puppy right there. That's what we got. And I was like, you know, who, who knows? <laughs> maybe they'll like it, maybe they won't. <laughs> I, I've had uh, a couple uh, or a runs in, uh, run-ins with uh, improvisation uh, on set or uh, with voiceover. Um, it is it is crucial, uh, I think, to an acting career to have a good solid base of improvisation. Not only does it help you with the process, it helps you to fluidly think of uh, you know backstory. Um, one of the things I was talking about earlier, it helps you to creatively think and open the box. Um, I had to do improv at one point. There was a condom commercial that I worked on, and uh, they wanted one-liners, so I just had to spell one-liners and. Uh, most recently oh for Ninjas vs. Monsters, my character has quite a potty mouth, and uh, they, they basically said, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna talk down to this guy and go. And it was a huge uh, potty-filled monologue. So, enjoy that when you see it, Ninjas vs. Monsters comes out. <laughs> and I'm always grateful when we, when we have a director that, well, how do you feel about it? I just love it because sometimes they'll, they'll give you things to say that sounds great when they're writing it down, but when the voice actor actually says it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I'm like, you mind if I try this? And they're going, oh, no, go ahead, whatever you feel like. So, yeah, you, you, you get those, uh, those few directors, and some guys are just like, no, we do it this way. Nothing. Another great thing about the improv is, is the fact that there's a thing that uh, voice actors refer to as being in the fishbowl where you're in a studio behind the glass and on, on the other side are the suits and the producers and uh, the clients and thanks to improv when you're in there auditioning and you see all these people and they're talking among themselves and they're actually talking about I don't know what do you want for lunch I'm not really sure but you're thinking to yourself they're all going like who is this guy who brought this whose idea was it to bring this person but if you're up there doing improv, then you just kind of let those things kind of settle off to the side and do what you're there for. Yeah, and, 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 and when you said make people make them laugh, you, you don't go out of your way, you know, not in a phony, fake way. You just be yourself, and, because they want to work with people who are fun. They want to, you know, there, there are tons of guys out there that have a lot of talent. Uh, but but can you work with them? Yeah, exactly. I, I did a, a callback for Kaijudo, rarely seen show that's on the hub right now and they already knew creatively that they liked me but they had to just interview me to see if they want to work with this guy for two years it's important all right sorry thank you very much thank you everybody. Hey, so uh, we're going to be back signing autographs from two to four and tomorrow we're doing a script read Let's Has see. anybody seen that? We haven't seen the script. We haven't seen the script, so. I'll have a table back there if anyone wants to come say hi. It's going to be from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., and then we'll sign some more autographs and close the convention. <laughs> we wore them down. We wore them down. <laughs> Somebody take a picture with my camera, too. I will allow you. Cool. There you go. We're all taking requests now. Uh, all right. Wait, just come on. Proud to be my melancholy day. Great, we're all baritone <laughs> <laughs>